have a pointer or is it? Both have a pointer, but pointer. yeah. So if yeah, there is a pointer, that's all right. I can I can just use my hands. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, all right. That's good. Okay. And one minute to spare. Thank you. Are you okay? Just so you know, this is what's being shared online. Ooh. The speaker knows. Okay, so we just need to. I think one of those. Maybe double. Yeah, you need to duplicate the uh, somehow. So there should be a button for this that I forgot. Just... Uh, switch this. This? Yeah. See what happens. No, it's, it's not. More about, it's more about that is switch. Switch oh, again. That... It's more about what you're sharing in Zoom. So maybe try a new share so that you're just sharing the slides. If you go back up to. Right. So that's yeah. oh. You mean, yeah, sure. hang on, there is a way, Go back to Zoom. so hang on, no, I think, so there there should be, right, That that's right, but oh yeah, there is display settings here, and duplicate slideshow, and now. Okay, but now you can see your speaker notes, is that That's right? fine, I, I, yeah. He doesn't need it. <laughs> he probably gave it that five times. It's, um, it's a poly course of phone. Oh, but, but. Well, hold on. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Uh, doesn't. I mean that. You know that precision is not really required. But yeah. Okay. Good. I guess. Thanks to you. I mean, you you advertise it enough. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm really glad. Yeah, that's 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 really a lot of people. They will come and meet us so that people see them. Okay, sure. How many do we talking about quantum images? I will and speak. Quantum imaging from that one. How about I say well, I will just say applications of things like to many different topics, including quantum imaging. And mm -hmm. you know, I would I would just emphasize quantum imaging because it's so important here. I have a question. Yeah, yeah, but, but so you might want to say that faint light happens everywhere and it's a natural for quantum. Okay, there are C's in the front. Do you, do you want to use microphone? Hello? If we turn it on. Yes. I don't know if it's working. It doesn't work. Oh, that's strange. So this mic doesn't work. So you want to, you want to use this? Does it work? Yeah. Okay, this works. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the weekly seminar at Center for Imaging Science. Uh, glad to see a broad audience in this room today. For you those, lost the you lost the connection. Oh, good. All right. So uh, my name is Jie Chao. I'm a faculty at the Center for Imaging Science, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Sergei Polikov. So Dr. Polikov is a project leader at the uh, NIST. NIST is also called National Institute of Standard Technology. And he leads the uh, quantum measurement division under the physical measurement laboratory. And uh, as I understand that a project leader at NIST is equivalent to a professor at the, in the uh, academic setting. And Dr. Polikov has uh, demonstrated the, uh, the world record of uh, verif verifying the accuracy of single photon characterization. Very impressive. 
and he earned his PhD at Creel, the Central University of Florida, 2003. And subsequently, he uh, did his postdoc at Caltech from 2003 to 2006. And then he joined NIST. Uh, actually, he um, you probably didn't know. I was actually surprised to see that he switched his gear from nonlinear optics to quantum after his PhD. That's quite impressive. And he is a fellow of Optica and the general chair of conference on lasers and electro optics, also called Clio, in 2021. Today, he will talk about the application of thin, thin light. You know, thin light is everywhere for astronomy, for imaging, particularly uh, including the uh, quantum imaging application. Uh, he will, the topic of his talk is the world where energy, every photon counts. Welcome, Dr. Polico. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for this nice introduction. And it's, I'm glad to be here. And uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful place uh, to spend uh, a day and maybe more than a day for somebody, maybe a few years. Uh, so uh, welcome to the new world where every single photon counts. And let's see the consequences of once you start living the life where you really cherish every single photon around you. But first, uh, let me take you through a little journey of uh, my career here. And uh, oh, this this is uh, uh, let's see if I can remove that. Yeah. Uh, all right. So um, I have uh, 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 well started at Moscow State University back in the days and got my PhD at Creel. Uh, then joined Caltech for short three years where I learned quantum. And this here is a setup that I worked on back in the days. And so, so from there, you start to really appreciate how complex experiments really look uh, like. And then at the same time, that was the career change for me from nonlinear optics to quantum optics. But, you know, a lot of nonlinear stuff is really helping to propel the uh, quantum, believe it or not. And then I actually joined the entangled state between the University of Maryland, NIST and JQI. And for the last 20 years, I was doing lots of different stuff and different allegiances to these places here. Uh, so currently I'm a project leader uh, at NIST. I have also a, a professorship uh, affiliation with the University of Maryland. Uh, that, that's an adjunct professor position. And the uh, Joint Quantum Institute is still playing a huge role for me, but less formally now than before. Uh, so this is the group in 2020, before the COVID hit. Uh, I unfortunately didn't do the update to the picture, but you basically get the idea of how many people are there and uh, what we're working on. Well, not what they're working on, but so what you will see is what they're working on really. Uh, so, but first also I wanted to introduce NIST a little bit more formally. Believe it or not, our agency is one of the few agencies that are right in your U.S. Constitution and even Article 1. So Article 1, Section 8 says that the Congress shall have power to fix standard in weight for, uh, of weights and measures. And that's where we come in and we are in a way constitutionally protected. Um, so... Uh, uh, it's it's great to uh, be a part of this journey, and so NIST is uh, really uh, trying to underpin with its research the standards that provides the trust for the uh, consumers in the United States and international trade, and that's why the trade is really important word here. That's why we are the part of the Department of Commerce, and our director is Under Secretary of Commerce for Standards and Technology. So currently, the NIST mission is to promote the U.S. innovation, uh, advancing measurement science, standards, and technology uh, in the ways that enhance economic security and improve our quality of life. And we really uh, are, uh, have grown significantly beyond just uh, doing the standards, because if you want to do standards, you need to know how to measure stuff. If you want to measure stuff, you start looking at different new technologies. And so uh, a lot of that uh, comes together to create some synergy, and that synergy uh, leads us to the world-leading scientific and engineering research. That is important to underpin your measurement science and standards. Then once you know how to measure and how to get to the point of measurement, you hit the manufacturing. And so we actually uh, help with uh, advancing manufacturing national programs, and every state has some kind of a footprint from these programs that are uh, central to NIST. 
Uh, also, we have dissemination for technology and standards uh, in trying to help the U.S. innovation in any way we can. Uh, the uh, core research at NIST is done in uh, six different laboratories. We call them laboratories, but they're really large organizational units. So to take physics, for example, we have more than a thousand people working in that. Just imagine the size of the laboratory we're talking about, right? So in addition, we have material measurements, that's mostly chemistry. Uh, we have information technology, which is actually very interesting. So those are the standards of UIT security and uh, lots of interesting things are happening there. Uh, you have communication technology. Everybody probably has a cell phone and 5G and uh, spectrum uh, characterizations are done with communication technology laboratory. Engineering laboratory, the structural integrity of this building here goes back to the standards. And then uh, we have a new center for neutron, uh, neutron research, which uh, helps uh, with radiation safety and different measurements there. So uh, NIST overall is providing a community and tries very hard to provide a community that is open for change. Everybody uh, is valued here. Everybody supported, engaged, and empowered. And uh, you know, you, uh, everybody, uh, particularly students here, may want to join uh, this happy family uh, when they are ready and when their professional life is right for that moment. So uh, having said that, Let's uh, jump into the into the uh, talk itself, the technical side of it. Uh, I promised you faint light. I promised you counting every single photon. So I will start with several states. So you have faint light here. And interestingly enough, uh, with the faint light has this quantum properties. And whenever you have very, very, very dim light, what you would expect is that something non-classical, not necessarily right in your face quantum, and for those people who are in the quantum field, they say it doesn't necessarily have to be any kind of entanglement up there. But nonetheless, there will be effects that are very, very different from your normal experience, both professional experience as an optical person, but also as your everyday experience as a person who have eye and can see. Uh, then, obviously, when you do measurement, those measurements can be done with a new kind of technology, which is called single photo detection. And single photo detection, as I will talk about, uh, is, is, is uh, at least a quantum 1.0 technology. That's one of the things that we try to classify different quantum technologies. So at the very least, it's a basic quantum technology. But if you're smart enough, you can take that and make an application based on those quantum properties that I talked about just now, connect those together, and actually have a very non-classical device. And uh, by taking advantage of this property and apply it, for different applications. So my major point today is to talk about these applications after really, you know, covering a little bit of the properties and measurement uh, that uh, we will just start with. So normally, when you do a measurement, and you know, for for the people who do imaging, uh, maybe it's easy to look at how the images are created. Uh, so normally, you would think about the measurement, and there is a, a object that you're trying to measure. It might generate some noise. You may get some noise in, in the middle of the process, and then there is that measurement occurs, and then the observer gets the result of the measurement. So everything is good, but you are not happy with the signal to noise. So what do you do? Normally, you start to work very, very hard to reduce the noise and keep the signal, so improve your signal to noise, and you work harder, 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 and now you're at this point. So what happens when you really got rid of all the uh, sources of noise, additive sources of noise. So classical view on the picture is that whatever comes out is getting measurement fa uh, measured painfully. And then if your measurement device is perfect, then you get uh, the observer gets the exact picture that happens here. Unfortunately, and quantumly, even if you worked really, really hard and very successful and re uh, reduced everything to having no noise all the way until the measurement here, the measurement itself in quantum is a source of noise. And the measurement itself tells you that interestingly enough, the source of noise is connected with the amount of physical resource that this measurement is allowed to consume. That's where every photon counts come from. So every single particle that you detect gives you a little bit of information about of reality, but not more. And everything else, and once you did this measurement, you, you actually perturb the system enough that you cannot repeat exactly the same measurement anymore. And that's why 
once you lost the photon or measured the photon, you measure the photon, this photon cannot be measured again. And so uh, one needs to be really careful about how to spend their photons. So in the quantum world, observing a system changes it. Uncertainty is the fundamental property of nature and quantum mechanics allows you to link the resource, in this case, the number of measured photons to the uh, uncertainty that you actually are entitled to in the measurement. And then quantum mechanics sends fundamental units of classical measurement and often helps find a better alternative that is, which is a next generation kind of measurement, which is not your typical classical measure. So how do you do that? What are the benefits of counting photons? Well, you can think about it as having a detector and then the photons are being detected as shown here. So you have information about each particular time detection of a photon, which is not the case with a classical optics because in classical optics, you just have a field and the field obviously doesn't have those photons. So you don't have this, you're not entitled to the information about the time. In some experiments, you can also count the photon number. So let just, let's say you assume that those here were pulses really. And inside that pulse, you might have one photon or more than one photon. And if you have a perfect detector, you can receive the number of photons and you can basically put it in your box and think about it that way, that in this particular pulse, you have measured five photons, three photons or whatever, how many you did. So those two things, they definitely don't exist in the classical uh, uh, structure of, of, of measurement with, start with classical detectors. Well, and to be fair, you need to add more detectors. And for instance, that's what happens if you have an imaging sensor, you have many, many detectors. So in the end, you have an access to free values for every time you get the detection event, which detector, which I, I call the, basically the position, the R, uh, which position, which detector clicked when, T, and how many photons, where behind it, that's N. So that's the information you got, and that's the information you have to use somehow to overcome classical. Now, what's very interesting here, it's very intricate, that this number N and the time T is the true number that has no uncertainty on it if you have a detector that is perfect. Uh, let's not talk about imperfect detectors for, for just a second. But the value that you measure, so it's really, in this particular case, that's a six photons that came at one at time T1. That's the fact. There is no uncertainty on that, which is great. But if you are interested in the quantity that is not the instantaneous photon number, then that doesn't help you directly. You can try and infer the number of photons for your classical intensity, for instance. For instance, what you can do is to create some bins and then measure how many photons you get in each bin and then average this number, right? But if you started to do that, each individual data point, which was exact, at least in theory, becomes now, a, a, well, a stochastic variable that you need to average to get your classical value. That's where shot noise comes in and your clever measurement didn't do you any good really at this point because you try to do better than shot noise, you can't because you asked the wrong question from the quantum mechanics problem. So if you want to just measure the common quantity, uh, you will still be hit by the shot noise as shown here. Not a good place to be at. Uh, but nonetheless, because this an extra information is accessible, if somehow you can use this N here or this time for the more accurate measurement, then that's that, that, that makes you clever and that makes you, well, really uh, uh, somebody who is making measurements in the quantum domain, better than classical domain. Now, what happens really with a single photon? Single photons, if you really take one and a, a, a photon and there is no other photons around, obviously is just one uh, excitation of the optical field. And uh, the best way to check it is to put it on a beam splitter. So what's going to happen is if you try to detect this uh, single photon, you will either detect it on this detector and, or on that detector, but not simultaneously on both because you simply don't have enough energy. Okay, are you with me here? So far, so good. All right, but multi-photon state obviously can produce more than one photon. And sometimes, you know, you would split these two photons and you will have a correlation. Okay, so 
single photon state, no correlation, multi photon state, uh, there is some kind of a correlation, non zero correlation. So far, so good. But in fact, there is more to this. Because if you just take it for the face value that the photon goes either to this detector or to that detector, then you have a problem. So that is a fundamental problem because, so let's say that photon well, went whichever way it went, can we really say that it, it's either uh, uh, present up, up here or down there? Unfortunately, well, you can run the experiment and the experiment is shown here. And if the photon, is only here or only there, then putting a, a phase modulation here would not would not do you in any way because the photon would either go here and get detected or goes here and get detected and this phase really doesn't matter. Unfortunately, this is not the case. You still get this kind of an interference. So what you need to assume that somehow the photon goes through both paths. And that's where normal people, such as myself, started to have a problem. But that kind of problem is also an opportunity to look for some new methods of how to exploit that fact, but not necessarily this fact, but exploit some of those facts that are quantum there in order to make a better measurement. So again, in here, in just a photo, some kind of propagation, detectors, nothing really, uh, nothing, nothing spectacular. So we just talked about single photons, and single photons uh, basically mean that you normally do not get a chance to detect more than one photon in that kind of state. So sometimes you could lose a photon that's allowed. So you either detect zero or one, but not two. Uh, but there are other states, and everybody is really familiar with a laser, that ends up giving you a Poisson distribution of uh, counts. And so it's really random from uh, you know shot to shot how many photons you will receive during an experiment. And in this particular case, I think we're talking about something like uh, 1.5 photons in average here. And uh, that, does, that, that means that you sometimes get one, sometimes get two, but also three, four, and five photons. So you can't really say how many photons there are. And so by the fact that you measured, let's say three photons at the instance, you can't really say too much about the intensity of that laser. Remember our, our discussion before, but you get a little bit of information. So we are talking about that kind of information and you need to accumulate the information for a long time. In this particular case, if you're trying to, 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 to restore uh, how many photons per pulse did you have in the laser state, then you will need to accumulate the information. But the fact that you uh, learn a little bit of piece of that, it's significant because you can describe that fact uh, mathematically and the amount of information you learn in a particular measurement is something that is very important for us as quantum optics physicists. Uh, there are other types of states that are also important and those happen in astronomy, for instance, when you have a, uh, the, the thermal state, then instead of this statistic here, uh, which is a Poisson statistic, you get a Bose-Einstein statistic as shown here, which is a different type of statistics, but nonetheless, uh, you can reconstruct and you can see uh, how the photon number distribution looks like, which is going to be important. Uh, but but if you wanted to see what the mean photon number is, obviously one measurement is not enough because one measurement produces just like there, just one number. Two, what did you learn about the state? Not much, but something nonetheless. And that's where the quantum measurement really comes about to tell you, to quantify how much of information did you did you extract in one act of measure. All right, so uh, how do you make single photons? Turns out that making single photons is not easy. Attenuating a laser is not going to do you any good because what you will get is, well, this component zero will grow, grow, grow. This component will go down, down, down. But they, these guys will also always be there because of the Poisson distribution. And the ratio between that and that will actually stay constant. And that's what we call this correlation function. So this is going to be equal to one, the, rate, the special ratio that we can create between the probability of this and the probability of that event is going to be giving you one, as opposed to here, where that ratio gives you zero because you will never encounter a two thing. Okay. So you need to do something special in order to create single photons, just shining lasers, no matter how dim or how bright, 
is not going to help you, nor the interference well. So you need to do something special. So typically, quantum is cured with quantum. So you need to have a two-level quantum system, any kind of system. If you, if you like atoms, that could be an atom, that could be an ion, that could be a quantum dust, that could be an envy center or a fluorophore molecule, whichever system you like. What's important for me is that you have a two-level system. You can start in the ground state where the system is not excited. You can excite the system with a normal laser, but the good news about it is once it's excited, you cannot really be re-excited twice because it's an only one isolated system. And only one excitation can be stored in that system. Then you switch that light up and all you get is, is a single photon coming out from this two-level system at some point in the field axis. That will be a true signal photon, and uh, simply because the system cannot trigger it twice at the same time, because you started from a single uh, quantum system from the beginning. Here are the examples of quantum systems. Uh, like I said, the quantum dots. So we are really looking at this point here. And closer this to zero is the better phase as a single photon source. Uh, so this is a single photon source. And the center is a good single photon source. A uh, fluorophore molecule, one, can be a good single photon source. And of course, you see no nuclear atoms. Uh, so in all these cases, you can measure correlations. Those correlations look pretty much identical. And uh, that allows you to really generate single photons. But importantly for imaging, actually, is the fluorophores and sometimes maybe MV centers, because you can use the fluorescence from either of the two for imaging. You can use biomarkers that are labeled with fluorophores, or you can use biomarkers that are NV centers in such a way that, or maybe, oh, in some cases, quantum dots too, actually. Uh, you can use them and see that there are single photon sources in your image. And you can, in fact, use the fact that you have single photon sources specifically to enhance the imaging in a quantum way. And we'll talk about that a little later. Which brings me to application of that fine flight concepts to biology. The first, very, very quickly, uh, uh, this experiment here is uh, something that happens with the blood of anybody who, who goes for uh, any kind of an advanced blood work. So if you're not familiar with what a flow cytometer is, your blood most certainly is familiar with that cytometer because uh, simply, well, this device sends your blood cells one by one through a special optical, well, uh, uh, through a special channel where it is optically addressed. And then you study, well, scattering from that place, but also all types of fluorescence. And in order to really understand what kind of cells they are, and sometimes if those are labeled and, uh, against particular diseases, well, then you actually can illuminate that and you find the concentration of, uh, of a particular biomarker in a sample, which tells you a difference between a healthy and disease state of the patient. But of course, the holy grail here is to be able to get to the signal to noise ratio that is uh, sensitive to just one, just one label, fluorescent label, at uh, the expense of many, many, many cells that have no fluorescent label. So we are talking about the situation of a needle in a haystack. So, the situation of a needle in a haystack is taken care of very well by the fact that you can run this device pretty, pretty quickly. But do you have enough signal to noise to really extract a single biomarker as those things pass by, as those things go on? Now, turns out that it's really important. It's not just a, uh, a question that somebody wants to ask for, for fun. Uh, cancer, early cancer diagnosis, uh, that actually requires that and also counting of your biomarkers. So if you can tell the difference between two and six in this particular case, you can tell the difference between the breast cancer that is uh, <coughs> aggressive versus non-aggressive, and you choose treatment at the onset of the disease, incre increasing the survivability chance. Uh, gene editing verification also requires you to see just one edit as opposed to two edits per cell and things like that. This is very, very interesting and important in terms of the uh, application side of it. But can you really be sensitive to single photon uh, in this, this very, very fast paced environment where you can only see uh, uh, a biomarker once for a short time? And the answer is yes, I will probably not talk about that if the answer was no, right? 
And so uh, uh, we measure these functions, the G2 functions, the correlation functions. And remember, if a function is equal to zero, you have a perfect measurement of a single photon state. And we have pretty, pretty low numbers in here uh, in different samples that show you that the signal to noise is actually enough to uh, actually see the difference between nothing and, well, having a single biomarker in the system. So I present you probably the best um, a signal to noise for single molecule, so for, for single fluorophores uh, device that have ever has uh, ha, has been created so far. The overall sensitivity of this device is not so great, but its sensitivity in terms of si signal to noise is equal to six for a single photon uh, floor for a single fluorophore detection. Excuse me. Uh, which brings me to uh, probably the main the main course of today, which is uh, using uh, well, the quantum uh, for imaging, and uh, for me, it's important uh, to to really enable people in biology because for them, seeing is not only believing but also uh, well, generating new knowledge. And uh, depending on which kind of imaging system we have, uh, we learn more and more about uh, the uh, the situation in uh, biomedical industry. And obviously, right now we're somewhere here in the in, in, in intercellular level, but obviously everybody here knows, and I'm probably preaching to a choir, that there is an end to the game, which is called, uh, a, 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 well, a relay criteria or relay curse. So at that point, let, let me quickly remind you that what you're talking about is two airy disks that are created by your diffraction and two airy disks that, that are superimposed and become increasingly hard to uh, to recognize from one image. And that's a known problem for all types of imaging and people are trying to solve it in many different ways. And uh, let me quickly give you a quantum point of view here. Again, remember we are counting every single photon. So how much information can you get from that event, from a single photon detection event? For that, you use Fisher information approach. Uh, that's basically, that's something that tells you uh, that uh, how much you can learn. And on this axis here is the distance between the two uh, area disks. And interestingly enough, if you thought that Rayleigh criterion is not really a very, very hard criterion, you are absolutely correct. It's not very hard, but it's damning nonetheless. This is the red curve here. And it tells you that the closer the two, uh, uh, the two area disks are, the harder and harder it gets to separate them. And in fact, direct imaging in this case is about the worst you can do. All right, there are met, but the classical Fisher information that is contained in those states, interestingly enough, does not change. This is where you use quantum in a way to learn that what we do in imaging is inadequate for this particular problem. So if you change something in the measurement, the information is there, we are just not getting it in the right way. So uh, there are different ways of, of, of trying to get that information and uh, but nonetheless, it's kind of difficult because you need to rethink your imaging device because instead of the image, you'll get something else. And people really don't like that. So normally in imaging, super resolution is done by localization, which means that you don't want to work with too many fluorophores in the field of view. Uh, if, they, if, if there are more than one in the every disk uh, vicinity of the other, you really don't want to be there. So you start thinking about methods of switching those guys on and off by different types of means. But that typically, well, and there are many, many different methods here. So you can actually get nice, nice pictures here. But what's interesting, the more is the density, the denser is the sample, the progressively, exponentially more time you need to, uh, to, to actually resolve this picture uh, by switching those things randomly on and off. If it's not random, it's, it's not going to be exponential. But in fact, if it's random, this process requires exponentially longer and longer times. You don't want to probably go that way if you have an alternative. And here is one possibility of alternative is to use natural properties of sources. So this will work for macroscopy because you can take advantage of single photons, single photon sources. Uh, that give you a different kind of statistics, remember? And then thermal is uh, actually for telescopes. So they are stellar objects and believe it or not, they generate, uh, they generate uh, uh, thermal states. 
which also have a different statistics from your laser beam. So all you need here is a, well, a normal imaging system, but you replace this guy here with a photon number resolving camera. That's the only thing that I need. So uh, I have one kind of a PMR panel. I can't really disclose which one. Uh, but um, so what we do is uh, we simulate this experiment because the cameras of today are kind of slow and uh, signal to noise is not so great, but you can still do the experiment that simulates the real experiment, but a little bit differently. So we generate an image by scanning uh, the beam, which is prepared as a quasi thermal state. It really doesn't matter how we do that. We have much time to talk about this, but so those are quasi thermal states and we scan them on the camera, basically simulating the image, uh, sorry, simulating the object and receiving the image. So given that you are all very familiar with the imaging, here is a riddle. So I can tell you right ahead that this image is formed by more than one source. How many sources were used? You have all the classical information, everybody does. Uh, how many sources are here? Can you tell? Six, any, uh, any other guesses? Well, obviously there is no way to tell, but I can just tell you the answer. There are three, not six. Well, we did five, but it, we will talk about that a bit later. There are three, they're really, really close to one another. You can't really resolve that. I mean, it's really, really hard to resolve that, but uh, it turns out that if you reconstruct, remember those plots that I showed before for thermal states like this? Um, if you reconstruct the uh, composition of this pixel after many, many, many takes, after many, many, many slides, so you take, uh, uh, you know, sometimes several exposures, many exposures, let's say 10,000 exposures on this particular case. And uh, you plot that histogram, you will see that this pixel here, is representing just one thermal state. And this pixel here represents, well, something like two. The other one is two, and then there is a little bit of the third uh, the thermal state. And in the end, in the center, you have approximately three of them. So you already know how many you want to count. There are three states there. And by the extra information from the outskirts like this, it allows you to really see how many sources you had. So this is the simulation, well, not it's a, uh, experimental simulation with five sources. I'm not gonna play this game with you anymore. <laughs> and this is the image that the classical commercial camera would see. And this is the photo number resolving camera. After you, after you process your image, like I said, given the, given the statistics, and obviously those clouds here basically tell you about the residual error of this measurement. And uh, unfortunately, given that the quality of the camera, you cannot do these experiments with single photon sources yet, but we can still see that there is a logarithmic improvement in localization of uh, using this quantum method over here versus the classical fit. And that's what you expect because at least quantumly, you know how many sources there are, be it single photon sources or thermal states. And so that extra information is available even if you cannot resolve the images. So even if the two of those stars were completely on top, on top of one another, even in that case, even in that case, you won't be able to resolve the second one is with respect to the first one, but you will at least know that there are two of them. All right. <clears throat> Uh, the intensities, yeah, yeah. So, the, yeah, so this is because because you guys are imaging center, uh, you're entitled to some more information from the under the hood, and you're you're we're really talking about this slide here. So this is the ground truth, which we can take on the camera by just shining one of the five sources and basically not shining the other ones. So those are the sources, and you can obviously find the sequoia of those, and that's how you know where those sources are located. And then what happens is then you do the reconstruction and the reconstruction gives you that. And by the way, you see that this source is dim, this source is bright. That's the artifact of our method of grading them. 
but you can tell that at least in some of these reconstructions, this is dimmer. That is brighter. That is brighter. Well, this is kind of this is dimmer. So yes, the answer to the question is yes, you can uh, you can see the difference. But obviously, those guys are reconstructed, so you find the centroid and then you plot everything else in a smooth way. That's how those images are so nice that these images are grainy. Okay, and that uh, basically covers our uh, quantum imaging part. And I wanted to spend the rest of my time on uh, faint light in telecommunications, but uh, maybe we have some questions uh, so far about the imaging because, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a, it, yeah. This is a, just a Hini. It could be a Hini laser. In this case, it's a little bit more stable. First, our experiment was on the Hini, but Hini, which we have, was not that stable. So we, it's a monochromatic source. Uh, it it will, yeah. Because uh, because uh, yeah, quantum mechanics will tell you why. It's, uh, well, there is a reason why these second order correlations are also called second order coherence. So the, the more coherence you have, the better. And so the more monochromatic you are, the better. So, and that's why I'm not calling this actual experiment. It's, exper it, it's an experimental uh, simulation in a way. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. I think you were first. Uh, oh, that's just steering the beam, moving it from one. So essentially, this. So depending on the uh, uh, frequency of uh, of the radio frequency wave, you get you, you get to steer it to this angle all the way to that angle. That's that's all there is to it. So the quantum part here is the is your ability to actually extract information about the statistics and knowing the properties, quantum properties of the sources to reconstruct the complex statistics such as this statistic. This statistic. So something that you know. So you know that those are thermal states. Thermal states in quantum behave like thermal states, like mosaic state statistics. So you can kind of see that this is the sum of three bosaic size statistics. That's the answer to your question? Yes, but this is not covered under this talk. Uh, but yeah, so we did it. it not, it's not for imaging. You, in fact, this method is a, is, is a very good remote sensing method for studying single photon sources, particularly those that are not perfect. And I, you know, I, I have nice papers about um, uh, quantum dots where, where we saw very, very interesting effects without even lifting the cover of a door. It's, it's, it's all in there. You're just counting photons, but you learn exactly what the physics is happening. Yeah. Can you get any information about the phase and the number of photons? Uh, phase and between, uh, so those sources, not necessarily have phase. So, for instance, single photon sources, single photon light is uh, is agnostic to phase, uh, and it's 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 kind of mind boggling. And especially if you start taking the photon and putting it in a beam splitter, at that point, the difference between the paths acquires an optical phase. So it's a little bit you know, but uh, so we didn't think about that because phase was not a consideration for the states. We didn't do the coherent state. In fact, you cannot do a coherent state. That's one of the draw drawbacks of this method. All right, so if not more, if we don't have more questions, let's uh, uh, take a look briefly about telecommunications and everybody uses internet and probably some of you are uh, looking at us from the uh, uh, privacy of your office or home. And uh, that is because of the availability of telecommunications. And interestingly enough, uh, people encode information in the optical states to get the uh, affordable internet for everybody. And we use phase of coherent states to uh, actually encode information, zero, one, or maybe more states in here. And why? Well, the classical method called heterodyne or homodyne, both methods actually work quite well, uh, are really, really good at detecting what phase uh, you actually have. 
it's really, really good, but not perfect. And quantum mechanics can tell you why. So if you, uh, before quantum mechanics, you just say, oh, there is noise, oh, there is signal, Shannon sphere, and great. You have some kind of a signal, really doesn't matter what energy. You have an energy of noise, signal to noise, gives you all the answers. But just remember from the takes of, of the before, uh, signal to noise, well, noise is, is, is a property of a signal in a way. And if you use the knowledge of the quantum measurement, you can relate the noise to actually the amount of the resource that you have, which is your photons that you count. And the error rate of a Hamadine measurement can be nicely summarized in this formula where n is the mean number of photons. This here is a key. This is physics right there. This is the probability of the informational error to receive something, you know, uh, to, to, to receive a wrong bit. So physics, information. Between them, you have the quantum measurement theory that tells you that equates apples to the oranges. But that tells you that there is also a better measurement that is not this with a lower error with the same end, apples to apples, oranges to oranges. In between, in order to activate these, you use quantum information, or in this case, quantum measurement theory. And quantum information theory allows you to put the scale here, which is the number, uh, mean for the number n, and this is what your traditional uh, receiver does, the, the, the homogen detection, and, but this is what you really can do if you're smart enough. Okay. Um, well, this here doesn't really tell you how to do this, and I will skip this slide, but this is really how you do that. So in, so you have a receiver, this is a receiver. Imagine that there is a second wave here, we just don't do it here as if it, it's a paper time. But you encode the signals here by phase. This is coherent step, and those are the states uh, which, are, which are different by, by initial phase. And then you do the same to your local oscillator. The trick here is that this beam splitter here is special, it's 99 to one, and you detect signal photons here. So this movie here will tell you exactly what happens. So, so you're trying to detect this guy, and you come with a local oscillator, this guy, and uh, they are arranged on 99 to one beam splitter, and if this guy is not the same as your input, then there is a non-zero output coming right here. So obviously there are very, very few photons, so you don't really get the detection all the time. But so the main point here, if those two were the same, then there will be no detection at all, okay? So let's run an, uh, one experiment. So we start at the point here where we know nothing about the input, hence the probability of having any output, uh, any, any, any input is exactly the same and equal to 25%. And we start the measurement on the symbol. So once you start, you uh, can come with some kind of a guess, it doesn't matter which guess you come from. And as time progresses, this does not really kill this light, but you don't get the detection for a long time, so there is no difference between this case and our case with the black thing. And so at some point, you get a detection that tells you that this guess was incorrect, so its probability goes down, gets diminished, and another one comes up, in this case, a yellow thing. So you rinse and repeat the measurement for the rest of the time or until you get a photon again. And if you get the detection again, like now, maybe, yeah? So it's uncertain where you get it. And so you get the detection, so that's your indication that yellow state was not the right state either. So you need to switch again. When finally you found the right state, there is no output and hopefully if everything is okay, you will not get the detection here. But at the end of the measurement, not only you found the best state uh, for the input, but also you have the reliability of your measurement shown in here. So you know with this error, uh, uh, percentage of error, that it was a sign. Uh, there was, well, other colors, but now I will mix them as the printers do and put it on a big spot, a big picture here. And this is a result of my measurement. But there are many of those measurements, each of these measurements, are not predictable at first, but once you get them proven measurement, 
you actually get a self estimate of how good this particular pixel was. So here you have a lot of magenta, so you know very well that this was a magenta state. And for this guy, you really have almost an equal probability of this case. So you know that you didn't very, you do a very good job at detecting uh, this particular outcome. So altogether, what gives it is you can generate the pictures like this. This is the input. This is transmitted. There are four colors. So there, this is a 128 by 20, 128 pixel array uh, that gets transmitted. So we graphically show the errors. Those are simulated for the ideal classical measurement where uncertainty is only due to shortness. This happens in the laboratory, and it's pretty clear that the errors that you get in the laboratory on any day are better than any classical receiver would ever do if, uh, even if they were perfect, which is really not that easy to make uh, a measurement of. In addition, you're ending up with those little hefty guys which are the confidences of each particular measurement. Uh, there is, uh, there are many, many ways to use that extra information that is not available classically. So, uh, so long as you understand one very interesting thing. So this here is the probability, but it's not a normal probability. It's not a frequency probability. It's not what you normally call probability. This is called Bayesian probability. That's basically your measurement system believes that the, the probability of error would be according to this distribution here for every single shot. Now, what quantum mechanics deals with is Kalmagorov or frequency probability, which is this. But in the experiment, you can actually look at ensembles of measurement and see that there is a good equivalent between the two. So you can actually use these Bayesian estimates as if they are true probabilities. So that gives you a lot of leverage in the quantum world because those values are the result of quantum measurement and quantum theory of measurement tells you something about the process of obtaining these guys and all the assumptions that went into this. So if you are starting to use those ideas for something, for something extra, you can actually do so. So in fact, you could take the that extra information and put it into your error correcting algorithm. And all of a sudden, uh, you can use the energy very wisely by, well, if you have a repetition method, you know, you send one symbol over and over and over again, then you get the error progression from this experimental point as shown here. If you start adding confidences, you get better error rates. And the only thing changes here, you're still doing this very, very primitive method of error correction by repetition. Uh, you immediately improve your situation by almost a factor of 10 in terms of the error rate. But if you're clever about, you know, how to select the encoding, then that encoding can go as low as approximately 10 to the minus 9. So you only get one uh, error per, uh, what is it, gigabit, one, giga, one error per gigabit using this kind of device. And well, last but not least, using similar methods and, 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 and using the displacement measurement, which I just talked to you about, you can reuse this experiment for stabilizing very, very long of the parameters. This is necessary for quantum networks, and quantum networks are really, really interesting for me for other purposes. Uh, but in this case, this spectrometer is 120 kilometers long. We stabilize it to a parametric stability of 86. Uh, visibility, 86%, and we use significantly less than 10 to the 6 photon per second at the receiver station to get that. That's only five orders of magnitude better than the state of the art. So with that, uh, what I didn't cover was my work on quantum networks at NIST. This is the most vibrant work at this point. There are many things that we are doing, very, very exciting. Uh, come talk to me about those. Uh, or, or just you know, write me an email. I, I will be able to respond to you guys on that. And those are my conclusions. Faint light, it occurs everywhere, always fundamentally quantum, and a good fit for your quantum measurement, and open for your for, for your creativity right there. Uh, quantum diaphotonics. I showed you a couple of experiments there, but in fact, there is a huge interest right now in this in this particular field. So if you're interested, by the time you graduate, this field will be really right. 
and you're in a good position to basically take upon some of these projects. For communications, I only talked about classical communications using very, very faint states. And we actually already talked about testing physical limits of communication, using characterization and metrology for uh, really uh, getting to the lowest possible uh, states to probe your system or to propagate your, your, your classical information. And uh, well, this research kind of helps us to, uh, to reimagine quantum networks, but I didn't really tell you much about what the quantum network is. So I will just stop right here and, uh, and uh, open the floor for more questions. So yeah, it was a little bit fast that I went through this, but so this here is not a real probability, right? This is, that's what your device degree of belief is, which is basically called Bayesian probability. But if you accumulate enough samples that you can that you can actually establish statistics, you would know that, okay, the estimate was 80%. You look at here, and in fact, in the ensemble, in the large ensemble, 80 times of, out of 100, you will be right by statistically, which means that that estimate was actually the estimate of a real physical thing that's represented by the Kolmogorov probability. Okay? A photo is, uh, and it's a, <laughs> yeah, so we just published the single photon sources and detectors dictionary, which uh, talks about this, it's a very loaded question, but it's a single excitation of electromagnetic field, which uh, operationally is defined by the two detectors looking through the 50-50 beam splitter where these uh, two detectors will never click at the same time. But non polarized non polarized non polarized beam splitter. Yeah, so this um, th that is an electromagnetic field. So you, so in fact, the photon is the excitation of the mode. The mode defines the the polarization, not the photon. The photo is so the mode is a pocket, and that pocket defines every physical aspect of it. And then you excite something inside that mode, and that's the photon. Uh -huh. uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah, but that's that's a multi-mode. Yeah, so those sources, unless you do something really special about them, are multi-mode, meaning that they would emit in many in many different directions, and the polarization might also change because the polarization of a dipole is that kind of thing. Where in which? So here we actually have coherent states. Here, in this experiment, we have coherent states. It's not a single, so, so yeah, I, I forgot to say this. This is, in average, 1.33 photons per bit. If you lost a photon, you lost a photon. You don't, you don't specifically handle this. You have to recover yourself. All the errors that we measure are real. But interestingly enough, if you only had well, a coherent state of a mean number of one, and you know that means that 30% of the time you will receive nothing. Interestingly enough, that state, uh, according to the Hellstrom bound, gives you 99, better than 99% of the chance to actually detect it correctly. Even though you get nothing 30% of the time. This is because you have to be clever. This is exactly so. Yeah, this is mind-boggling. But this is uh, so. This here is the quantum theory of of measurement. It tells you that you have one photon in average, and your state has thirty percent, thirty percent of the chance of you know measuring zero. Theoretically, you could have recovered the correct state ninety-nine percent out of. That's why every single photon counts. Because if you lose one photon, and the Eve will get that. 99% of the time, we will never. Welcome to a world where everything, every single photon counts. Yeah. 
questions, um, there will be coffee and uh, outside, um, more often to, to discuss with the speaker. If you want to have a follow up, you can email me and I can provide the uh, and yeah, you, you can save yourself some trouble uh, and review my talk once again, right? Right. Okay, I Thank you. I appreciate that. Then a little bit about what you do.